question, discuss about the independence of the judiciary and the political nature of judicial process. The independence of the judiciary and the political nature of the judicial process. The Indian judiciary is famous for being independent and impartial. The independence of the judiciary is of the utmost importance in upholding the pillars of the democratic system and the fundamental rights. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary needs to be kept away from the other branches of government. I.e. courts should not be subject to improper influence from the other branches of government, or from private or partisan interests. The Indian judiciary is famous for being independent and impartial. The independence of the judiciary is of the utmost importance in upholding the pillars of the democratic system and the fundamental rights. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary needs to be kept away from the other branches of government, i.e. courts should not be subject to improper influence from the other branches of government, or from private or partisan interests. The Indian judiciary is famous for being independent and impartial. The independence of the judiciary is of the utmost importance in upholding the pillars of the democratic system and the fundamental rights. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary needs to be kept away from the other branches of government. I.e. courts should not be subject to improper influence from the other branches of government, or from private or partisan interests. The Indian judiciary is famous for being independent and impartial. The independence of the judiciary is of the utmost importance in upholding the pillars of the democratic system and the fundamental rights. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary needs to be kept away from the other branches of government, i.e. courts should not be subject to improper influence from the other branches of government, or from private or partisan interests. The independence of the judiciary and the political nature of the judicial process. The Indian judiciary is famous for being independent and impartial. The independence of the judiciary is of the utmost importance in upholding the pillars of the democratic system and the fundamental rights. Judicial independence is the idea that the judiciary needs to be kept away from the other branches of government, i.e. courts should not be subject to improper influence from other branches of government, or from private or partisan interests. Justice should not only be done, it must also be seen to be done. This is an famous legal maxim which states that justice must be there in a real sense and justice be like that people should say that justice is taken place. For the purpose of justice in purposes, the authority or institute which gives the justice should be free from any kind of pressure or influences. Independence of judiciary is an international phenomenon where justice should be independent from the influence other state organs. Justice is a sacrosanct human right. None should be the victim of denial of justice. The denial may be due to any reason should not be condemned at any cost because justice is faith of being a member of civilized society. If this faith is disturbed, the entire humanity and civilized system will also disturb. So for the protection of civilized society, there should not be injustice with the member of civilized society. The noble work is given to judiciary, to do the justice and restore the faith of people to protect society for long life and welfare of human being. It is a well-known fact that the independence of the judiciary is the basic requisite for ensuring a free and fair society under the rule of law. Rule of law that is responsible for good governance of the country can be secured through an unbiased judiciary. Independence of judiciary is a part of doctrine of basic structure and essential features of the constitution. Sikri C.J. explained the concept of basic structure in the case one and case as follows.
केसवानंद भारती वी स्टेट ऑफ केरला ए आई आर वन नाइन सेवन थ्री एस सी वन थाउजेंड फोर हंड्रेड एंड सिक्सटी वन वन सुप्रीमेसी ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन टू रिपब्लिकन एंड डेमोक्रेटिक फॉर्म ऑफ गवर्नमेंट थ्री सेक्युलर कैरेक्टर ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन फोर सेपरेशन ऑफ पावर्स बिटवीन द लेजिस्लेचर एग्जीक्यूटिव एंड द जुडिशरी फाइव फेडरल कैरेक्टर ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन द डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ सेपरेशन ऑफ पावर्स which was brought into existence to draw upon the boundaries for the functioning of all the three organs of the state the legislature the executive and the judiciary provides for a responsibility for the judiciary to act as a watchdog and to check whether the executive and the legislature are functioning within their limits under the constitution and not interfere for in each other's functioning This task given to the judiciary to supervise the doctrine of separation of powers cannot be carried on in true spirit if the judiciary is not independent in itself. An independent judiciary supports the basis of the doctrine of separation of powers to a large extent. The reason for independence of the judiciary The basic need for the independence of the judiciary rests upon the following points. A to check the functioning of the organs judiciary acts as a watchdog by ensuring that all the organs of the state function within their respective areas and according to the provisions of the constitution dot judiciary acts as a guardian of the constitution and also aids in securing the doctrine of separation of powers b interpreting the provisions of the constitution It was well known to the framers of the constitution that in future the ambiguity will arise with the provisions of the constitution so they ensured that the judiciary must be independent and self competent to interpret the provision of the constitution in such a way to clear the ambiguity but such an interpretation must be unbiased i.e. free from any pressure from an organs like executive if the judiciary is not independent the others may pressurize the judiciary to interpret the provision of the constitution according to them judiciary is given the job of interpreting the constitution according to the constitutional philosophy and the constitutional norms c disputes referred to the judiciary it is expected of the judiciary to deliver judicial justice and not partial or committed justice by committed justice we mean to say that when a judge emphasizes on a particular aspect while giving justice and not considering all the aspects involved in a particular situation similarly judiciary must act in an unbiased manner nature and scope independence of judiciary means a fair and neutral judicial system of accountry which can afford to take its decision without any interference of the executive or legislative branch of government independence of the judiciary depends on some certain conditions like mode of appointment of judges security of their tenure in the office and adequate remuneration and privileges The general concept of judicial independence is that a judge should be free from any pressure from the government or anyone else as to how to decide any particular case judge's salary is not dependent on the executive decision and his conditions of service are secured and not to be varied at the whim of the executives The judiciary has been defined as the last resort of the common people It is the sector that actually protects and harmonizes the varying interests of the members of the society. The judiciary has been the major recourse of the human rights community in the enforcement of human rights. Litigation has been identified as one of the key means of protecting and enforcing the rights of the individual. No other institution of the state is bestowed with the duty but the courts and other ancillary institutions. Most of the monumental achievements of the human rights community the world ever have been through the courts. The judiciary comprises all institutions established there under for the administration of justice to protect, vindicate and enforce the rights of the people. 
the judiciary is charged with the responsibility of dispensing justice and safeguarding the rule of law. In any civilized society, judiciary is the last resort for the people to seek shelter and get relief against offenders and wrongdoers. Independence of the judiciary truly means that the judges are in a position to render justice in accordance with their oath of office and only in accordance with their own sense of justice without submitting to any kind of pressure or influence, be it from the executive or legislative or from parties themselves or from the superiors and colleagues. Independence of judiciary depends on some certain conditions like mode of appointment of the judges, security of their tenure in the office and adequate remuneration and privileges. The concept of judicial independence, as recent international efforts into this field suggest, comprises the following four meanings of judicial independence. 1. Substantive independence of the judges it referred to as functional decisional independence, meaning the independence of judges to arrive at their decisions without submitting to any inside or outside pressure. 2. Personal independence, that means the judges are not dependent on government in any way in which might influence them in reaching decisions in particular cases. 3. Collective independence, that means institutional administrative and financial independence of the judiciary as a whole vis-a-vis -vis other branches of the government, namely the executive and the legislative. For internal independence, that means independence of judges from their judicial superiors and colleagues. It refers to in other words independence of a judges or a judicial officer from any kind of order indication or pressure from his judicial superiors and colleagues in deciding cases. Independence of the judiciary depends on certain conditions like mode of appointment of the judges, security of their tenure in the office and adequate remuneration and privileges. Satisfactory implementation of the SEC conditions enables the judiciary to perform its due role in the society thus inviting public confidence in it. The administration of justice is the vital task of judiciary. Justice which is the soul of the state must be administered without fear or favor. Hence judiciary should remain as far as possible outside politics. In interpreting laws and administering justice the judges must be impartial and honest. The vital need is to organize the judiciary properly. The appointment and tenure of the judges, their relation to other agencies of government, these and other similar considerations are important in maintaining the independence and integrity of the judiciary. Whenever there is a talk regarding the independence of the judiciary, there is also a talk restrictions that must be imposed on the judiciary as an institution and on the individual judges that form a part of the judiciary. Other organs of state for the judges politics many times criticize higher judiciary. Judges are indulging them for judicial legislation. The excessive encroachment of judges in the domain of executive results in the criticism of judges politics. On the other hand political interference or politics the judges appointment, removal and the matter concerning thereto. The judiciary of India is an independent body and is separate from the executive and legislative bodies of the Indian government. Indian constitution makes the Indian judiciary a self-regulatory body. The Supreme Court and High Courts exercise powers of superintendence and also lay the procedures for conduct of business in the courts. It is clear from the historical overview that judicial independence has faced many obstacles in the past, especially in relation to the appointment and the transfer of judges. Courts have always tried to uphold the independence of judiciary and have always said that the independence of the judiciary is a basic feature of the constitution.
courts have said so because the independence of the judiciary is the prerequisite for the smooth functioning of the constitution and for realization of a democratic society based on the rule of law. 3. Discuss the concept of dharm in Indian thought. Philosophy and morality are so closely intertwined that only can they be properly understood with a thorough grasp of India's religious and philosophical traditions. Ethics is a complicated and multifaceted subject in India since it comprises several diverse religious and philosophical traditions. Indian morality, complex and multifaceted like the rest of Indian culture, reflects this multiplicity of metaphysical views and valuational attitudes. The idea that there is a distinct worldview, ethos, or moral code that can be referred to as Indian as such must be avoided, nevertheless. Despite being open to new concepts and ideals, Indian tradition has included certain of these in its religio-moral philosophy. What is dharm? Dharm is the Indian word meaning morals and ethics. The word, dharm, derives from the root, dhr, which means to hold. Dharm, therefore, serves to maintain the stability and development of human civilization by acting as a unifying force within it. If human civilization is to thrive, then moral behavior is crucial. Dharm and morality are intertwined in Hinduism. The Dharmasastras and the Vedas perform Vedic sacrifices and other rituals, and, Dharm, refers to the ultimate truth and power in the Vedas. Dharm is therefore defined in the Vedas as exceptional responsibility. Dharm is also typically defined as the obligations owed by people based on their caste and stage of life, Varnasrama dharm. Thus, according to many Hindu thinkers, doing one's duty will result in either achieving paradise, having a better birth in the future life, or even achieving affluence in the present. As a result, the Hindu notion of dharm has been identified by its intimate links to ceremonial and caste-based obligations. Moreover, the obligation that stems only from morality is obscured. However, Hindu philosophers support and encourage the practice of moral qualities and standards that define a man as a man. Sadhana dharm, or universal obligations, refers to these moral traits. As a result, the word, dharm, in Hinduism has two meanings. Execution of ceremonial sacrifices and responsibilities by one's caste. Application of moral qualities and standards. Dharm in Vedic period Indian ethics may be traced back to the Vedas, notably the Rig Veda, from which we can learn about its early development. The idea of a moral rule or unifying order permeating everything is known as Rta and it is one of Rig Veda's fundamental ethical notions. Two more significant notions, Dharm and Karma, have their roots in the term, Rta. Dharm has various and varied connotations, but it is most commonly associated with obligation. The idea of Karma denotes a single moral code governing human behavior and determining the rewards and punishments fitting for those activities. The basis for these two ideas is, Rta. The love and adoration offered to the gods in total subjection is the more crucial and fundamental component of Vedic ethics. One who makes these sacrifices and the ceremonial responsibilities outlined in the scriptures will accomplish the goal of eternal pleasure in heaven, because the proper execution of sacrifices reflects moral order or law. As a result, the Vedic Hindus' ethics are essentially God-oriented. In contrast to the Rig Veda, the Upanishads state that freedom from enslavement to transient existence and the realization of the inner essence of the soul are life's greatest goals. Atman-centric and intellectualistic are the main characteristics of Upanishadic ethics. According to the Upanishads, 
the Vedic sacrifices are wholly unnecessary for achieving moksha. Man is continually urged to pursue his own personal emancipation and to care less about other social and moral obligations. This form of intellectual individualism unquestionably threatens the principles of social morality. The Upanishads emphasize the connection and realization of self with Brahman. Only in this metaphysical space are we able to discuss Upanishad ethics. According to the earliest Upanishads, a saint who burns away evil and is free from evil is the ideal sage. We can observe the Upanishads' obvious moral message in their emphasis on avoiding evil. According to Katha Upanishad 1-24, a person who is always unclean is born again and again and is unable to achieve the greatest objective. To achieve man's metaphysical good, good behavior is required, identification of self with Brahman. Moreover, a wise man has a good moral character and a nature similar to God's. Therefore, it is apparent from the Upanishads that a wise man does not sin. He stops doing evil and using knowledge, and he undoes the wrongdoing of his previous existence. Vanashrama Dharm Vanashrama is the name of the Vedic system of existence, and Vandham is the Sanskrit term meaning social class. Along with promoting personal peace and growth, it is intended to maintain societal order, social progress, and social harmony. The word, worm, in the Aji Veda refers to skin tone, and humans are divided into ions and dasas. Dasas are people with dark skin, while ions have pale skin. The word, worm, comes from the root, we are which means to pick or choose. Vern, divided into Brahmana, Ksatri, Vaishya, and Sudra classes, denotes a specific group or class in a community. The term Vern refers to the four roles in human society, generally in Purasasukta. The terms Brahman, Rajanya, Vaishya, and Sudra appear in Purasasukta. However, these phrases are not used to denote the four vanas but rather the four roles of society as a whole. The entire cosmos, according to Purasasukta, is a manifestation of the Purasa, or universal self. The lips of a Brahman, the arms of a Rajanya, the thighs of a Vaishya, and the feet of a Sudra make up a body. The mouth, which serves as the place of communication, stands for education, the arms for power, the thighs for productive effort, and the feet for other manual labor. Therefore, rather than the four words, the four phrases refer to the four functions. Like the caste system, jati-based or birth-based worm is now repressive and exploitative. As the foundation of Vedic sociology is Vedic psychology, Worm is founded on one's personality, Swabhava, or Guna. According to Vedic psychology, the human mind has three characteristics, propensities or temperaments. They reveal an individual's true character. They are Rajas, active, Tamas, passive, Sattva, non-active, quality of purity, goodness, wisdom, and knowledge. Worm is the method of choice used by the person to advance his mental growth. It represents the human mind's psychological foundation, inclination, and cause. The four worms represent the four fundamental human natures and allude to the four social orders. It is a comprehensive description of people based on their tendencies, pravritis, or enjoyment of life. It does not represent life's occupations, vrittis. One's career may be changed, but one's nature cannot. The jati or caste system enters when worm is understood as a profession rather than a tendency. The worm system, not the jati system, is discussed in Vedic sociology. Worm is the social stratification based on aptitude or ability. 
Since it relies on a person's traits, no one is superior or inferior. As a result, it represents the egalitarian spirit. Ethics in Dharma Sastras and Itihasas The primary texts for Hindu ritualism and social morality are the institutions of Manu and other Dharma Sastras. While the Manusmriti gave societal institutions priority over individuality, the Upanishads strongly emphasized the individual's freedom. Hindu social morality is relativistic in several ways because, although being an individual, one belongs to a family, a subcaste, and is always cared for by the family in which he is. It is acknowledged that man's obligations are related to space, yuga, and time, desa. A person's responsibilities are also firmly related to his or her worm, class, and period of life, asrama. Some virtues have been declared to be universal by Manu. They are cleanliness, socha, non-stealing, asteya, self-control, dharm, self-forgiveness, kshama, forgiveness, kshama, knowledge of the supreme atman, vidya, honesty, satya, and lack of wrath, akrodha. These moral qualities are known as sadhana dharm, or common, universal morality. Thus, while each dharma sastras, epic, and puranas has a distinct purpose, they appear to have a similar, ethos, regarding ethics. Concept of Dharm 3 According to Hindu philosophy, the Brahmakari, studenthood, a student constrained to celibacy, is one of four phases or ashramas that comprise one's existence. The householder is the second stage, followed by the woodland dweller, vanaprastha, and the sannyasin, grihastha, the mendicant. Men should frequently experience these stages. They should be started early enough. A man must join the householder order after studying the Vedas, or even only one Veda, in the proper order and without departing from celibacy. Furthermore, only then must the homeowner retreat to the wilderness after noticing wrinkles on his skin, whiteness in his hair, and the appearance of his grandson. The guy wanders as an ascetic, the fourth portion of life, after having completed the third phase of life in the forests and giving up attachments. This succession is considered crucial to the healthy development of the Jivatma and the harmonious organization of society. Question Discuss John Rawls' theory of justice in the present-day context. The Whiskey Rebellion and the New American Republic Vertical Bar Cicero, defender of the Roman Republic Vertical Bar, Justice as Fairness, John Rawls and his theory of justice. Justice as Fairness, John Rawls and his theory of justice. Many consider John Rawls the most important political philosopher of the 20th century. He took an old idea, thought of a fresh way of using it, and came up with principles for a just society. John Rawls was born in Baltimore, Maryland, in 1921. His father, a corporate lawyer, supported President Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. His mother was a women's rights activist. The second of five sons, Rawls tragically contracted and passed on infectious diseases to two of his brothers who died from them. Rawls attended mainly private schools before entering Princeton in 1939. He was unsure about a career but ended up majoring in philosophy. This stimulated an interest in religion and he considered training for the ministry. After graduating with a degree in philosophy in 1943, he enlisted in the army and served in the South Pacific for two years in an infantry intelligence unit. After his discharge from the army following the war, he returned to Princeton and pursued an advanced degree in philosophy under the GI Bill of Rights. He earned his Ph.D. in 1948. In 1950, 
Princeton hired Rawls as an instructor in the philosophy department. But he also continued his own studies, especially in economics. In 1952, Rawls won a Fulbright Fellowship to Oxford where he first developed the idea for what later became his famous thought experiment. After returning to the United States, he joined the philosophy faculty at Cornell, then at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and finally at Harvard. He remained a professor of philosophy at Harvard from 1962 until he retired in 1991. Rawls was mainly an academic man, involved in abstract thinking and writing. During the Vietnam War, however, he led an effort at Harvard that questioned the fairness of student military draft deferments. Why, he asked, should college students, many with social and economic advantages, avoid the draft while others without these advantages had to go to war. He preferred a lottery system, which the United States eventually adopted late in the Vietnam War. During the 1960s he mainly concentrated on writing a theory of justice, published in 1971. This complex work attempted to develop standards or principles of social justice that could apply to real societies. Justice as Fairness Rawls called his concept of social justice, justice as fairness. It consists of two principles. Since he first published a theory of justice, he has changed the wording of these principles several times. He published his last version in 2001. The first principle of social justice concerns political institutions, every person has the same and indefeasible, permanent, claim to a fully adequate scheme of equal basic liberties, which scheme is compatible with the same scheme of liberties for all. This principle means that everyone has the same basic liberties which can never be taken away. Rawls included most of the liberties in the U.S. Bill of Rights, such as freedom of speech and due process of law. He added some liberties in the broader area of human rights, like freedom of travel. Rawls recognized the right of private individuals, corporations, or workers to own private property. But he omitted the right to own the means of production, e.g., mines, factories, farms. He also left out the right to inherit wealth. These things were not basic liberties in his view. Rawls agreed that basic liberties could be limited, but only for the sake of liberty. Thus, curbing the liberties of an intolerant group that intended to harm the liberties of others may be justified. The second principle of social justice concerns social and economic institutions. Social and economic inequalities are to satisfy two conditions. First, they are to be attached to offices and positions open to all under conditions of fair equality of opportunity, and second, they are to be to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged members of society. The difference principle. This second principle focused on equality. Rawls realized that a society could not avoid inequalities among its people. Inequalities result from such things as one's inherited characteristics, social class, personal motivation, and even luck. Even so, Rawls insisted that a just society should find ways to reduce inequalities in areas where it can act. By offices and positions, in his second principle, Rawls meant especially the best jobs in private business and public employment. He said that these jobs should be open to everyone by the society, providing fair equality of opportunity. One way for a society to do this would be to eliminate discrimination. Another way would be to provide everyone with easy access to education. The most controversial element of his theory of social justice was his difference principle. 
he first defined it in a 1968 essay. All differences in wealth and income, all social and economic inequalities, he wrote, should work for the good of the least favored. Later, when he wrote a theory of justice, he used the phrase, least advantaged members of society, to refer to those at the bottom of economic ladder. These might be unskilled individuals, earning the lowest wages in society. Under the difference principle, Rawls favored maximizing the improvement of the least advantaged group in society. He would do this not only by providing fair equality of opportunity, but also by such possible ways as a guaranteed minimum income or minimum wage, his preference. Rawls agreed that this difference principle gave his theory of social justice a liberal character. Finally, Rawls ranked his principles of social justice in the order of their priority. The first principle, basic liberties, holds priority over the second principle. The first part of the second principle, fair equality of opportunity, holds priority over the second part, difference principle. But he believed that both the first and second principles together are necessary for a just society. The thought experiment, Rawls was interested in political philosophy. Thus he focused on the basic institutions of society. Unless such institutions as the constitution, economy, and education system operated in a fair way for all, he argued, social justice would not exist in a society. Rawls set out to discover an impartial way to decide what the best principles for a just society were. He reached back several hundred years to philosophers like John Locke and Jean Jackie Rousseau who had developed the idea of a social contract. Locke and Rousseau had written that people in the distant past had formed a contract between themselves and their leader. The people would obey their leader, usually a king, and he would guarantee their natural rights. This would be the basis for a just society. Thomas Jefferson relied on this social contract idea in writing the Declaration of Independence. By the 20th century, most philosophers had dismissed the social contract as a quaint myth. Rawls, however, revived the social contract concept of people agreeing what constitutes a just society. Rawls devised a hypothetical version of the social contract. Some have called it a thought experiment, Rawls called it the original position. This was not a real gathering with real people, bargaining over an agreement. Instead, it was an imaginary meeting held under strict conditions that permitted individuals to deliberate only by using their reason and logic. Their task was to evaluate principles of social justice and choose the best ones. Their decision would be binding on their society forever. Rawls added a requirement to assure that the choice of social justice principles would truly be impartial. The persons in this mental exercise had to choose their justice principles under a well of ignorance. This meant that these individuals would know nothing about their particular positions in society. It was as if some force had plucked these people from a society and caused them to experience severe amnesia. Under the well of ignorance, these imaginary people would not know their own age, sex, race, social class, religion, abilities, preferences, life goals, or anything else about themselves. They would also be ignorant of the society from which they came. They would, however, have general knowledge about how such institutions as economic systems and governments worked. Rawls argued that only under a well of ignorance could human beings reach a fair and impartial agreement, contract, as true equals not biased by their place in society.
they would have to rely only on the human powers of reason to choose principles of social justice for their society. Rawls set up his thought experiment with several given systems of social justice principles. The task of the imaginary group members under the well of ignorance was to choose one system of principles for their own society. Rawls was mainly interested to see what choice the group would make between his own justice as fairness concept and another called average utility. This concept of justice called for maximizing the average wealth of the people. Making the choice the fictional persons in the experiment, using their powers of reason and logic, would first have to decide what most people in most societies want. Rawls reasoned that rational human beings would choose four things, which he called the primary goods, wealth and income rights and liberties, opportunities for advancement, self-respect in the next and crucial step. The participants would have to decide how a society should go about justly distributing these primary goods among its people. Clearly, designing economic political, and social institutions that favored the most advantaged members of the society would not be justice for all. On the other hand, the members of the experiment group would rationally agree that equal rights and liberties, opportunities, and self-respect for all would be just. But what about everyone having equal wealth and income? Rawls was sure the parties would reasonably conclude that some, but not extreme, inequality of wealth and income is necessary in a just society. Entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders should be rewarded for working to improve the economy and wealth of society. Then how should wealth and income be distributed in a just society if not equally or skewed toward the rich? Again using their reason and logic, Rawls argued, the imaginary parties would adopt what philosophers call the maximum minimum, or maximum, rule. Under this rule, the best choice is the highest minimum. Average wage per hour legal minimum wage society A $20 $7 society B $30 $1 in the example above, the best choice under the Maximin rule would be society A, which has the highest minimum wage. Those earning the average wage and above are doing pretty well as well. Society B with its higher average wage benefits those in the middle and at the top income levels, but largely ignores those at the bottom. This is the flow of the average utility social justice system, according to Rawls. Similarly, Rawls believed the persons in his experiment would rationally choose principles of social justice that maximized benefits for the least advantaged. The individuals under the well of ignorance do not know what position they really occupy in their society. Any one of them might be Bill Gates or an unemployed high school dropout. To be on the safe side, Rawls maintained, the rational thinking members of the imaginary group would choose the principles of justice that most benefited those at the bottom. In this way, Rawls believed, he had demonstrated that his justice and fairness principles, skewed toward the least advantaged, were the best for building or reforming institutions for a just society. Rawls did not think the United States was yet a just society since it did not satisfy his difference principle. To Rawls, wealth and power in the United States were concentrated too much in the hands of the most advantaged. A theory of justice revitalized political philosophy. Rawls' book was translated into 28 languages. Philosophers all over the world wrote essays and books that discussed, analyzed, and criticized his complex theory of social justice. 
criticism of Rawls Some critics argued that Rawls' justice as fairness principles did not allow enough tolerance for different religious and strongly held beliefs. If, for example, people belong to a religion that teaches men and women are unequal in certain parts of life, those beliefs would contradict Rawls' principles about equality of basic liberties and equal opportunity. The most controversial part of Rawls' theory of justice centered on his difference principle, the idea that the greatest benefit should go to the least advantaged. Conservative and free market critics argued that it is unfair to take from the most advantaged people what they have earned and redistribute it for the benefit of the less fortunate. They also argue that explanations for how people come to be in more or less advantaged positions is relevant to fairness. For example, some people deserve a higher level of material goods because of their hard work or contributions to society. Rawls himself acknowledged that his vision for a just society was highly idealized. He also admitted that there was little support for his difference principle in our public culture at the present time. Rawls responded to his critics by rethinking and revising elements of his theory. Even after he retired in 1991, Rawls wrote other books on political philosophy, international justice, and human rights. But he never really finished a theory of justice. He considered it a work in progress up to his death at age 81 in 2002. For discussion and writing. 1. Why did Rawls use the well of ignorance in his thought experiment? 2. Rawls said that basic liberties can be restricted only for the sake of liberty. Do you agree or disagree? Why? 3. Do you agree or disagree with Rawls' difference principle? Why? For further reading, Freeman, Samuel, ed. The Cambridge Companion to Rawls. Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2003. Richardson, Henry S., John Rawls. The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy, 2005 URL. HTTP URL. ACTIVITY Justice as Fairness Form 6 Groups to each evaluate one of the proposals listed below according to John Rawls' Justice as Fairness Theory. Group members should answer these questions about the proposal they are evaluating. 1. Does the proposal pass or fail John Rawls' two principles of justice such as fairness? Why? 2. Do you agree or disagree with the proposal? Why? Proposals. A. Outlaw burning the U.S. flag as a form of political protest. B. Provide affirmative action in employment for women and racial minorities. C. Provide free health care for everyone. D. Enact a high minimum wage. E. Do away with all inheritance taxes. F. Provide free public education from preschool to college. Each group should report its answers to the evaluation questions. The students should then discuss whether they like or dislike John Rawls' justice as fairness idea. Question. What is the meaning, scope and extent of judicial review of administrative actions by the Supreme Court of India under various articles of the Indian Constitution? As seen throughout the evolution of humanity, power sings a song of corruption in man's ear. Absolute power and control have oft led to tyranny, aggression and complete chaos. Instances of such kind can even be seen in today's modern society within countries such as North Korea, China and Africa. It is of no surprise that several attempts have been made starting from as early as the Roman Republic to raise limitations on the exercise of such power. The easiest and most practical way to curb political absolution was to separate powers between different organs of the government, thereby making these organs complement and control each other in a system of checks and balances.
the French philosopher Montesquieu is commonly associated with the doctrine of separation of powers and is one of the first to propound the idea of an executive, a legislature, and a judiciary. He argued that each organ should only exercise its functions and overlap between the three must be avoided as far as possible. He also emphasized that the independence of the judiciary should be real and not merely imaginary. The judicial organ of a government was seen as the most important of the three being independent and unchecked. Such a separation was crucial to prevent any one of the branches from attaining supremacy, thus ensuring political liberty. Judicial review is such an aspect of judicial power that ensures and enforces constitutional discipline with regards to the exercise of power by administrative agencies. This power of review embodies the concept of separation of powers as an integral component of the rule of law, which is the most essential feature of constitutions all over the world, especially in context of the Indian constitution. State actions have to be tested against the backdrop of the rule of law and it falls upon the courts to perform this exercise. Although the judiciary has been vested with the power to review legislative, executive and administrative actions, the points of consideration in this article will revolve around the latter. Judicial Review from an Indian Perspective Judicial review is premised around the idea that the constitution being the supreme law in a country dictates the functions and limitations associated with a government. Thus, any action taken by the government that is against, or in contravention of the principles embodied in the constitution would be invalid. Administrative law is recognized as a separate legal discipline in India since the 20th century and plays an integral role in the daily life of an individual. And it may also be defined as the branch of public law which deals with the powers and organization of quasi-administrative and administrative agencies. It concerns itself with rule application action rulemaking action and adjudicatory action by prescribing specific rules and principles through which such actions are achieved, keeping in mind individual freedom and liberty. An obvious need to ensure that such administrative agencies are effective in the service of individuals and remain within their bounds, therefore arises. In other words, in a democratic country like India, there must be a means to hold those who wield or exercise public power accountable for their conduct. The founding blocks of the system of review of administrative action in India were inherited from Britain. The law surrounding the judicial review of administrative action has been developed case by case by the Indian judiciary creating a mechanism of control that would govern administrative law. The current views regarding the same have been expressed by the Apex Court of India in the case of Indian Railway Construction Co. v. Ajay Kumar, while stating that the present trend of judicial opinion is to restrict immunity from judicial review to a selected class of cases such as the deployment of troops, entering into treaties at an international level, national security etc. thereby expanding the scope of judicial review. In recent cases, courts have signified their willingness to assert the power vested in them to scrutinize the factual basis on which discretionary powers may have been exercised. The Indian constitution establishes the doctrine of judicial review in several articles such as 13, 32, 226, 227 etc. and courts are meant to fulfill the function of sentinels on alert where matters relating to constitutionality are concerned. 
the supremacy of the constitution and the importance of judicial review are expounded in various judgments of the apex court of india such as state of rajasthan v union of india where it explains that it is the courts that have been tasked with the delicate task of determining the limits and extent of powers assigned to different branches of the government and also if any actions of a branch exceeds their limits case one and the bharti's case while emphasizing on the importance of judicial review established it as an integral part of the constitutional framework which ensures that the guarantees afforded by fundamental rights are not hindered at the same time It is also important to remember that the constitution has been worded in a way such that there are certain inherent limitations. The makers did so with the intent of ensuring that the judiciary fulfills its function rather than taking over those of the other branches. Judicial review has many times generated tensions and controversies between the different arms of the government. and at times has even led to constitutional amendments in order to dilute the effect of judicial pronouncements that were not agreeable with the government in power at the time the judiciary has often been criticized for overreaching and making laws as opposed to merely interpreting them however despite such claims it cannot be disputed that judicial review is still a core aspect of the constitution and has even been said to form a part of the basic structure objective nature and scope no individual must be denied fair and just treatment the same would not be possible if rampant abuse of powers by administrative authorities is left unchecked The quest of the judiciary in administrative matters is to set right any unfair action by means of administrative review and to strike the ever essential balance between discretion granted to administrative agencies as per policy and the need for fairness. The same has been stated in Union of India and Anna versus SB Vohra and Ors. The court must therefore resist the temptation to draw the bounds too tightly merely according to its own opinion it must strive to apply an objective standard which leaves to the deciding authority the full range of choices which the legislature is presumed to have intended the decisions which are extravagant or capricious cannot be legitimate Several mechanisms of accountability exist in the indian system such as election impeachment and public opinion still there was also a need to evolve a more specific and concentrated alternative to check excess of administrative bodies judicial review serves this purpose and is regarded as the heart of administrative law in many countries all over the world including india in minerva mills limited versus union of india The Supreme Court makes it abundantly clear that the constitution created a piece of independent machinery the judiciary vested with the power of judicial review to determine the legality of executive action while stating that this power is fundamental to the maintenance of democracy as a whole judicial review is the touchstone and essence of the rule of law and the dimensions within which it operates must remain flexible it is of such importance that it cannot be abrogated without affecting the basic structure of the constitution an argument against the immense power granted to courts is that it has weakened the other parts of the government but it is this very power and independence that ensures that it may act without fear or favor without being biased by political ideology or economic theory without free reign the much needed judicial activism would not be a possibility the result being unbridled power in the hands of the executive and the legislature the birth of the doctrine of basic structure is one such example of essential judicial activism and judicial review issues where political questions were the subject matter seemed to be outside the scope of judicial review and the courts themselves initially expressed the view however 
This slowly changed over the years. Since it is the job of the judiciary to interpret the provisions of the Constitution, and the Constitution is the touchstone against which actions of the Parliament need to be tested, these issues can therefore only be decided by the courts. Such sentiments were expressed in various judgments such as A. K. Roy, K. K. Abu, and State of Rajasthan v. UI. Extent and Limitations Looking through the pages of history books it can easily be seen that there has been considerable friction and a struggle for power between the different arms of the government and various issues such as amending the constitution have constantly been in question. Over the years the judiciary seems to have become more aware of its powers and has broken out its restraints, thereby attaining a desirable standard of independence. Many judges have often pointed out that the relationship between the judiciary and the executive must not be cozy, and a certain amount of tension is also desirable. It can be seen from various cases that now judicial review does not particularly suffer from any limitations except the restraints that judges might decide to put on themselves regarding what may be considered justified in a particular scenario. XCJIJTK.G Balakrishnan, in his speeches emphasized the fact that the extent of judicial review should not be curtailed, it functions as a means to guard the liberty of the people against the unwarranted executive or legislative action. He also stated the judiciary is equally amenable to criticism when the occasion demands it. However, it must be kept in mind that the courts have been given great responsibility and illegitimate criticism can have a damning effect on the effectiveness with which courts operate. The scope and extent of review vary from case to case basis and depends heavily on the facts and circumstances, and the court zealously guards human and fundamental rights as well as the citizens' rights to life and liberty as also several non-statutory powers of governmental bodies with regards their control over assets and property which may otherwise be expended on charitable causes such as building hospitals, roads, or even compensating victims of crime. Limitations on the scope of review have been handpicked from common law, certain general principles such as illegality, irrationality, impropriety were laid down in the case of Council of Civil Services Union vs. Min of Civil Services on the basis of which the powers of review may be exercised. It can be seen that in recent times many high courts have been going against the basic rule regarding review, and abusing their powers to substitute the decisions of authorities with their own effectively. There have also been instances where courts have applied the above-mentioned principles in an inconsistent manner as well as interfering with administrative authorities on their own consideration. There have been multiple cases where the Supreme Court has had to overturn such decisions, reprimanding courts to exercise the powers of review in an appropriate manner and staying within bounds of their powers. That being said, the Supreme Court is also not without faults and has failed to follow its own rules in many cases or has failed to interfere in cases where an actual need presented itself. Such arbitrariness, grouping together the above-mentioned action on the part of different courts, is a growing concern and presents a threat to the bedrock of administrative justice, and it undermines the legitimacy of review over administrative authorities. Since India follows precedents, such decisions are likely to impact future decisions as well. Finally, Public faith in the court system is impacted in a negative fashion, and this may lead to importance of judicial review, which as discussed earlier is an essential aspect of democracy and the rule of law, as a weapon designed to protect the masses from a transgression against their rights and liberty. Courts as a generality should refrain from interfering in political and policy manner unless the situation demands it. 
even in such a situations interference can only be based on specific selected grounds. In P.U.C.L versus Union of India, the Apex Court clearly states that the court cannot examine the need for enacting specific legislation, POCA in present case, as the same is a matter of policy and the mere possibility of abuse cannot be used as ground to declare an act unconstitutional. Administrative actions are reviewed by courts with a view to ensure that they are in accordance with legal principles. Reviews are, however, not to be understood as appeals. Appeals against a decision of authority would allow the appellate authority to go into the merits of such decision. Under judicial review, the court does not have the authority to delve into the merits of the actions of the administration. Going into the merits would be equivalent to substituting the decision of the authority by one of its own. The function of the court is to ensure that administrative authorities act in accordance with law and do not exceed the power that is vested in them. Such authorities are usually granted their powers under various statutes, and it is these statutes themselves which also provide for their limitations. Interference by courts would be unwarranted as long the authority acts within the ambit of powers granted to it. As stated in the case of State of Madhya Pradesh and Ors vs MSMV Vyavsaya and Co., the power of the High Court under Article 226 of the Constitution is not akin to appellate power. It is a supervisory power. While exercising this power, the Court does not go into the merits of the decision taken by the authorities concerned. Still, it only ensures that the decision is arrived at in accordance with the procedure prescribed by law and in accordance with the principles of natural justice wherever applicable. Further, where there are disputed questions of fact, the High Court does not normally go into or adjudicate upon the disputed questions of fact. The important question to be considered is how the decision has been arrived at by an authority as opposed to the review of the merits of the decision itself. Thus, the two questions to be determined by the reviewing court are 1. Whether the authority in question has acted in an inordinate manner and 2. Whether such powers have been abused. Even though the presumption of validity regarding administrative actions is less than that in the case of legislative action, courts should exercise self-restraint when it comes to using its discretionary powers in relation to the discretion that has been granted to administrative bodies, parameters of judicial review should be well defined, and all efforts must be made to ensure that they are not exceeded. It is after all the duty of the executive to administer the law, and courts should only assume a supervisory rule, doing any more under the false pretense of preventing abuse would make the court itself guilty of usurping power. The administrator's right to trial and error cannot be taken away as long as it has been exercised in a bona fide manner. The extent of review should not be so broad that administrative agencies are turned into mere vehicles for the transfer of cases to courts, the same would diminish the value of these agencies to a great extent and nullify their power to deliver decisions on matters they are empowered to handle. Grounds for Exercising the Power of Review In the modern system of governance, many powers, both legislative and adjudicatory, have been outsourced to administrative authorities. Thus judicial review has become an extremely important tool to curb the malignant use of these powers. The grounds on which administrative actions can be reviewed are not by any means exhaustive, however, they may be condensed into the following four, as a generality. Illegality. Irrationality procedural fairness, proportionality.
in addition to the above certain doctrines have evolved on the basis of natural justice, and the same has been used by courts in various cases to take action against administrative action where a legitimate need has arisen. Although the article will not delve into the specifics regarding these doctrines, a few are mentioned below, rule against bias, fair hearing, doctrine of promissory estoppel, doctrine of legitimate expectation, doctrine of proportionality, doctrine of public accountability.